Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to, um, Craig Island, on behalf of the Texas Trial Lawyers Association and personally uh, for my law firm against the bill. Okay. I'm glad uh, Mr. Milton is here because I think there's a prime example here for specifically to your district that will be important. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to walk you through the bill, uh, talking about the concerns I have with specific provisions, and hopefully we can address them in the future. Okay. Um, on page uh, three of the bill, the speculative damages, it says economic damages means compensatory damages. This item does not include speculative damages. And so what I think that that's trying to get to is a debate among um, the, in litigation. So you've got, just think about the condos here in downtown Austin that are being built. Got a 30-story uh, condominium. You got 30 windows per floor. You got 900 windows. There's a claim that the windows are leaking and that they were installed improperly. So do you go? Do you require all 900 windows to be um, inspected, or do you do a statistical sampling and do five or t five windows on each floor that shows that they were all installed pro improperly? And then you come up and say, okay, the expert testifies to the arbitrator or the judge. Um, out of the 900 windows, we inspected 60 and or 100, pick a number, and they were all installed improperly, therefore they all need to be replaced. That's what I believe that they're getting at with, quote, speculative damages. If you go to the next page, it is um, on page four. These are the things that a contractor is not liable for. Okay, at the very bottom, it says a contractor's reliance on written information relating to the residents, et cetera, if the information was false and it's inserted outdated or inaccurate and the contractor did not know and could not reasonably have known. So how does a contractor not know that they're relying on outdated information? So I think that we might can address whatever that issue is, but I'm just not exactly sure what that's getting into. But the next um, F is the really concerning part. A contractor will not be liable under F for any condition, including noncompliance with building codes, standards, warranties, manufacturer's recommendations, or contractual plan or specifications that do not result in, quote, actual physical damage or the failure of a building component to perform its intended function or purpose at the time of the notice. So let's look at that and break it down. And this is, Mr. Milton, this is an example in your district, a builder in the Tuya area, you're supposed to pull a windstorm certification to prove that you built the house with clips and straps. There was a builder that built the whole subdivision, uh, did not pull a windstorm certificate, did not, and, and because at the time, um, all state and state farm were riding in that area. However, three years later, well, those, those insurance companies pull out, and now the people had to go to get in, um, insurance from TWIA. What did TWIA ask? Where's your windstorm certification? And they said, well, we don't have one. And they said, well, you gotta go tear into your build, your home and prove that you have clips and straps or you've gotta go at them. So under this bill, there's no actual physical damage because just because you didn't have clips and straps doesn't mean your house is damaged, but they did fail to comply with building codes and standards. But there'd be no remedy here. And just like Monica said, if you have a firewall that doesn't go all the way up to the attic, that's a defect, but it's not causing any damage. There's no physical damage. I have about 50 of these cases. I've never had a reckless case until last year. I have 50 of these cases where the damage results from um, high humidity causing mold and mycotoxins, okay, creating problems throughout the house. And this is in right on the edge of your district. So is mold and mycotoxins in your walls actual physical damage? I don't know, but I think somebody would argue that having mold and, and mycotoxins in your home and high humidity levels, which leads to that, is not, quote, actual physical damage. Your roof is installed improperly, but it's not leaking. But you, but it's, it's installed improperly, so your warranty is no good, and you would not have a claim under here until your roof actually leaked. You can, you can prove, and nobody could admit, yes, this roof is put on wrong, but it's not leaking yet because it hasn't been a high wind event. Also, another example, the windows are installed in your house improperly. 
most of the rain comes from the west side. So the windows on the west side are leaking. The windows on the east side are not leaking because that's where you don't get rain from, but they're installed improperly. Under the writing here, the windows are um, performing their intended function and there's no physical, actual physical damage yet to the east side. So you'd have a claim for your windows on the west side of your house that are leaking, but you wouldn't have a claim for the windows on the east side of your house that are installed improperly and are, uh, violate the warranty of the manufacturer, but they're not leaking yet, so you don't have a claim. So those are issues in that one section, Mr. Chairman, that I have concerns about. Mm -hmm. Also, so I think that's probably enough there. Um, on page six, multiple um, inspections. I understand that there are times, especially on condominium projects, where you need multiple inspections, but I don't think that we can leave it um, just wide open for homeowners, and I would suggest here that we pick three. If your, your first guy comes out, he says, hey, I need to get an engineer out here, and then the engineer comes out here and says, hey, I need to get an HVAC expert out here, by the third time, you ought to be able to figure out everything you need. Okay. Um, over on page seven. Craig, i got to ask you to wrap. I mean, yep. a lot of this we've already talked about, and I know there's a lot more, but um, just for purposes of time, yes, sir. try to get to a... Yep. I, so the one thing, Mr. Chairman, so other people talk about the statute of repose because that's a, a big issue. Um, Condominium developers usually do not turn over the condominium HOA Homer Association until 75% of the units are sold. Often that'll take five, six years before 75% of the units get sold. A, a developer could, and, if it's, and should, if it's five years, hold 30% of those units out um, and not sell them so that the statute of repose runs, then put the others up for sale now he's got a clean bill of health because the owner of the HOA could bring those claims and the developer controlled HOA is not going to do it. The last thing, Mr. Chairman, I got to tell you is the one thing that you can and should do when you put this bill out is you need to fix um, developers and builders who are requiring homeowners to contract away their RECLA remedies by contract. You're going to hear from a lady in a minute. She got an arbitrator's award of $260,000 um, for compensatory damage. The arbitrator, a retired Republican judge from Houston, awarded attorney's fees of $166,000, arbitration costs of $24,000 for arbitration, and expert witness fees of $32,000. The builder has, has, uh, has that case on appeal because they say that that homeowner contracted away their RECLA rights by contract, and therefore, instead of recovering 263000 plus their expenses, they should recover $39,000 to go fix their house. That is not what RECLA was for. I was here when it was passed. It's to make the homeowner whole. You can stop home, um, builders from inserting clauses and, and void them so that people can be made whole under RECLA. Mm. Okay. All right, Craig, thank you. I appreciate your uh, your thoughts on this and look forward to working with you on it. Yeah, you, Representative Johnson. So you reminded me of a story that happened to me. One time I was remodeling a house, and um, the electricians were all up in my attic, and then another con sub, sub came down and said, you know, Ms. Johnson, they're not performing up to code. I'm like, what do you mean they're not performing up to code? And they're like, why are not doing all these things? So I called them. I said, I'm told you're not performing up to code. And he goes, well, you didn't ask us to bid it to code. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> that was their answer. I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize one had to ask you to bid it to code. Right. And so I guess, you know, you kind of highlighted, I think, some of the issues about this. My concern is protecting that um, single homeowner. One of the questions you, you kind of talked about um, how it would affect more mass building situations but how tell me how does this affect just the single homeowner trying to build a new house or remodel their house with whatever contractor comes knocking on their door after tornadoes or after whatever comes through because you know in the dallas tornadoes uh, it's no secret that uh, my house was destroyed in that and what i saw 
over and over and over was just people knocking like crazy, contractors trying to get the job and make promises that they couldn't fulfill. How does this bill affect that person? Well, it would, the bill would, number one, reduce the amount of time that you could bring a claim from 10 years to five years. So if you don't identify it in five years, and, and especially in the situation right now where you have a lot of people selling houses, right? So you buy a house that's three years old, you've got two years to find out if any defect uh, manifests itself or you are um, out of luck forever. You have no remedy at all. Um, and when a house is not built to code or standard or warranty, um, there's no remedy because you go to the manufacturer and say, hey, I have a 20-year roof and it's not performing. They come and say, well, it was installed improperly and therefore the warranty is void. And then you say, well, okay, I'm going to go back to my home builder. And how would that affect insurability? I mean, if you if you know then that you have a roof that, to your point, that's not, let's say, that doesn't have the straps like you were talking about, right. well, and, and, and then you have to disclose that to an insurance company if you're trying to get care coverage for your home? Yes, well, in Mr. Middleton's area, you, and all through the 14 coastal counties, you would have, you would, you wouldn't be insurable from Twia, or it'd be ex, it cost extra because if you don't, if you don't have a windstorm certificate, I believe the remedy is you got to pay a whole lot extra, um, but there's no remedy for it. You're just on your own. Thanks, Craig, for coming. Members, any other questions? All right, Craig, thank you, sir.